Um, so, yeah, hi. Uh, first off, thanks a lot for having me. It's uh, my first JSConf and first time in Berlin. It's really, really nice. I really like it. So does my daughter. She's having a blast <laughs> right now. Um, as Adi said, um, my name is Mathieu Henry. I'm a JavaScript developer at Opera Software. I've been there for about nine years now. Done yeah, one million things. Now I mostly work on the desktop browser. Um, but most people know me as P01. Um, this is the name I've gone by in the demo scene for about 20, 25 years. And this is also how I got into Opera. Um, I entered a demo scene contest. And someone at Opera saw it and contacted me asking if I wanted to join them. And I was like, sure, let's go. Uh, but then you might be wondering, what is this demo scene thing that I'm talking about? The uh, demo scene was born here in Berlin 30 years ago as an offspring of a cracking scene. Crackers are very, very talented hackers. They take commercial softwares. They reverse engineer them. They remove the protections so that they can release them for free. Of course, it's fully illegal. But um, And back in the 80s, we were only leaving their name in the, in the high score tables, if it was a game, like Pac-Man or anything, or in the splash, uh, splash page of a, of a program they are cracking. But in 84, the group Berlin Cracking Service did something really unique. They added their own intro to the program they cracked. All it was was this image. No animation, no sound, and we're showing the emblem of the city of Berlin. But it started a revolution, because soon all the crack started with this kind of intro and became more interesting, more fancy. And it became so cool that the demo scene was born. These little demos were then released independently of cracks. And now the demo scene is basically a group of creative people who make real-time audiovisual animations. And they just try to push the limits, the artistic limits and the technical limits. So it's really about yeah, pushing the, the boundaries in all directions. Um, because it's born from the, from the cracking scene, it's very social and very competitive. The, the social part, you can really see it in the fact that every year there's at least 50 events all around the world, mostly in Europe, but also in the States, in Japan. There's some in Australia as well, where there's live concerts, seminars, a bit like here, where we explain techniques and very, very advanced things. Uh, but most of all, there's competitions in many categories. The queen category is the demo ca competition, uh, where you have 64 megabytes, 128 megabytes, depending, uh, to make the most amazing real-time animation you can. And then this goes down to different size constraints, like 64 kilobyte, 4 kilobyte, 1 kilobyte, and down to the insane 256 bytes. Um, but it's not just about these programming um, competitions, it's also more artistic competitions like uh, musics and uh, uh, sorry, musics and uh, and graphics. So there's yeah, graphic competitions and also short movies and animations. And the, the demo scene touches many many platforms. So nowadays it's mostly on modern PCs. It, it's also on Amiga and Atari computers on 8-bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It's also on 8-bit uh, computers, like the Atari XL and the Commodore 64. <laughs> but it, it also goes on uh, mobile phones, video game consoles, like modern ones, and also old ones, like uh, the Vectrex, for instance, or the NES, or the yeah, Genesis. But people also make demos on the most crazy platforms. Uh, they make demos on oscilloscopes. Some people make their own custom hardware just to make demos, and just for the heck of it. <laughs> this goes far, really far. Um, the most insane, I think, in my mind is also demos on OHP, uh, this overhead display that we saw in high school, junior high school, with like a big light bulb and a mirror, and you just project something with plastic sheets. So people make demos with that. It's just bizarre. <laughs> um, and, uh, sorry, the back then, back in the 80s, the main distribution platform or main way of distribution for demos was um, you would take a stack of floppy disks, copy the latest demo, send them by mail, and uh, a few weeks later you would get your floppy disk back and your stamps back with more demos. And uh, yeah, it will go, go on and on. 
Then came the BBSs uh, in the 80s, 90s. That was some kind of precursor of the internet. But now everything is done on the internet. And the crazy, crazy thing, uh, which is not so crazy for you guys, is that the web is a viable platform to make demos. And yeah, really, the demo scene is about pushing the limits. And one of them is size. So how could we go about making a small demo on the web? Well, first of all, you, you need to start from an idea, uh, a concept. So your concept for your small demo can be very simple, like just an idea or a word or sketches. I, I really like to sketch my ideas and even make like small storyboards. Here you can see a couple of steps like yeah, at the top, like one, two, three, four, five steps. Um, and something that I do now a bit more is to make a mood board. So I just try to yeah, I just go online and save images all the time. And sometimes I, I see some images to, uh, that inspire me and that could work well together if I just combine them and animate them. And this is the mood board for one project I'm working on. So we will see where, where this goes. Um, and once you have your, your concept, it's time to prototype it. The idea of prototyping is really to, uh, to see if your concept is, works, if it's possible in the, the constraints you, are, you have. Um, it's also about finding the right technique to, to display your, your demo. Um, the web offers many ways to draw things. Um, if you use yeah, if you just want to do overlays, simple overlays things, the DOM is perfect. If you want to do um, street view kind of things where you have a static observer that just looks around, CSS3D really is perfect for that. To move things in 2D and 3D, 2D canvas is OK. And uh, for the heavy duty stuff, WebGL is king. So here's something I don't do often, but I'm going to show you a preview of a project I'm working on. Um, so hopefully this should be finished in a couple of weeks, and we'll have sound on synchronization, and it should be, yeah, good. <laughs> uh, there's still lots of work to do, but uh, I'll get there. So once you have done your prototypes and you have valid, uh, or you know that you can do your ID, it's time to optimize it. And uh, when you want to draw things to make animations, you will play a bit with numbers and uh, a bit of trigonometry. So there's a couple of uh, cheap approximations of uh, pies and fraction of pies that can save you some bytes. <laughs> <Is> it, <laughs> it sounds crazy, but uh, when you try to do something in 256 bytes, that helps. You need it. Um, numbers in uh, JavaScript, you know that they are actually floating point numbers. They are working base two. So the first loop at the top that increments by 0.1 will end up with i being equal to 10.09 and something. Uh, this is because point 0.1 cannot be exactly expressed as a, as in base 2 as combinations of powers of 2 and fractions of powers of 2. The, the second loop, since the increment is 1 over 8, every number in this loop can be expressed exactly. So the loop ends with 10. It looks like nothing, but it means that during this loop, you can use modulo on an integer value. And the modulo will land exactly, so you can actually in a cheap way, nest two loops by just using the right increment. So that can save you a lot of bytes also. Um, but really what you should do is try to reduce your function footprint. So one thing that uh, Jed Schmidt told us is that you should use the same function signature. In this example, we have two functions. First one takes two arguments and compare them and return. The next one doesn't need these arguments, but by using the same function signature, they will compress better. So just add a little bit of redundancy to increase the, the pattern so that they will compress better in the end. Uh, but something else you can do is also you can try to shadow things. In the case of functions, we have these two functions that do two things. We can combine them together. We can make one function that takes two arguments. And if one argument is passed, we do something. And if no argument is passed, we just fall through and do the rest, do the second function. Uh, the same goes for code blocks. So you can have one loop that does, um, yeah, but checks the value of one property, draw a small square, and then compute the next position. Typically, you would do that in two loops. Like first one will compute the position, and second one will display things. But you can just flip them together. But these things are they are nice. But what you should really do is to simplify your idea. 
simplify your technique and how you will do things. Um, I had this project a few months back that was called Minami District, where I wanted to display 1,000 buildings in 1,000 bytes and just spin around and everything. So this looks a bit like this. And one common problem, or one big challenge I had with this one, was how do I know which window to actually draw on the, for each building? So the common way would be to look at one building and for each window, compute the normal vector for the window, uh, window that tells me where this window is facing. If the Z coordinate is positive, it means it's facing towards the camera. If it's negative, it's facing away. But it's a little bit tricky to do that in 1K and yeah, with more things. So another way that I looked at is just think of how I draw these windows. I just go from one side of the window to the next one. And if you follow the numbers, like one, two, two three, four, if the numbers actually go towards your right, towards your left, sorry, <laughs> it means that the window is facing the camera, so I draw it. So if the difference in x from one edge to the next one is positive, I draw it. If it's negative, I don't draw it. It's facing away. It was much easier, much more compact. Um, for this other project uh, that I call Matraca, I wanted to display some kind of crazy surface, crazy object with um, lighting. And I tried many formulas to, to describe this surface. I tried even to use the source code as the surface, as a height map. But the best one was actually the most simple. It was just this cos x, cos y. It gives very smooth bumps in all directions, in x and in y. And the very nice thing about this is that since it's a very simple formula, it has a very simple derivative. And the derivative gives me the curvature of this surface. By knowing the curvature, I know where the surface is facing, so I know what is, which light it receives. So I just take this value, and it gives me the light for the surface at a given point. Uh, if you have, in the mood board that I showed you, there was like one image of many, many triangles. And how you would do that normally is you would process all your triangles together and check the coordinate of the three points and sort them to know in which order to display them. But if the triangles are small enough, you cannot think of them as confettis and just approximate them by that particle. So you just sort the triangles individually, and not every vertices. And it's much more simple to, to sort this. But these simplifications are often not enough. You often need to go ahead and fake it. And you need to fake many things. Like in computer graphics, you often want to, to figure out to light your objects. And in 76, Jim Blin came up with this idea of environment mapping. What it does is basically look at, in every possible direction that your object can be facing, check what is the light, what can be seen in every possible direction. And it makes an image out of it. So this is the image you see on the left where you are basically sitting in the center of a room, and it looks in every possible direction. And you see, OK, in this direction, you would see the window. In this other direction, you would see a door of the floor. And when we want to render this kind of teapot on the other side, you check what is the direction that is, that is this teapot facing for at this point of the surface. And you just pick the color in that image and just put it here, and you're done. And you can also extend this idea. So when you build this image that contains the, uh, sorry, that contains the color that you would see in every possible direction, you could also store the position of your small triangle or, small, or your reference um, coordinate system. So you would store the color and also the position of a small triangle in space as if it was oriented in this direction. And so you have that for all possible directions which means that if you want to display a big amount of triangles and have them with light, and even with multiple lights, you could just do like one lookup, and you have the light and the position of a triangle, and it's almost for free. So you can do all these um, this kinds of cheating. And so you often want to, to cast shadows to make things look a bit more realistic. And sharp shadows are, yeah, they don't look super nice, so it's nice to make it all soft. And the, the most simple way to do it is, as you draw your elements during your frame, you would draw the elements on the floor in a separate canvas at a smaller resolution, like a quarter, or divide your resolution by 4, 16, or 32. 
And when you're done, you just expand your smaller canvas behind the canvas where you draw all your, all your things. And by stretching it, it becomes all smooth and blurry. It's very cheap, and it does the trick. It really does the trick. And uh, once you have done that, well, good job. You have your audio, <laughs> your visuals. It's time to think about the audio. And uh, on the web, there's basically two ways to do sound. There's the web audio API and the audio element. Web audio API is super powerful. It can do real-time uh, sound synthesis and analysis. But it's, it's a bit there was. And also, regular 1K and 4 kilobyte demos, we usually start with a black screen for a few seconds, we generate the music, and then, boom, the visuals kick in. And that fits very well with the audio element, because with just that much code, that's like less than 200 bytes, you can generate sound and play it. That's all you need. Um, so when you generate sound, you have to think about the Nyquist frequency. Uh, the Nyquist frequency sounds yeah, uh, very techy, but it's basically the lowest frequency at least at which you can sample or generate a, a music without getting audio glitches. And it's basically twice the frequency of your, the highest note in your music. So when you generate music, generate at, at least twice the frequency of your highest note. You can generate higher, but the lower the frequency means the less data you need to generate, which means the faster your intro will start. So you, you will get slightly lower sound quality, but your intro will start maybe five or 10 seconds sooner. That, that can be nice. Um, how do you build music with that? Uh, well, you start from small building blocks. Uh, you need to build instruments. So if you want to do a, you know, something simple like a, a hi-hat, you would basically start from the first line, which just gives like pure noise, like And the second line just does an exponential decay that does like And you, with a second and third line of code, it adds that to your music. And then it's nice, but then since we generate the music before the animations, how do we do uh, synchronization with that? It's not that hard. When you generate the sound, you know exactly at which position in the sound you are. So you can store in a separate array which notes you are actually playing at this position and at which volume, which means that during the, uh, your animation, you can check the current time of your audio element, multiply by 60, which is your frame rate in frames per second, and you know where in your synchronization buffer you need to pick to know which notes are playing and at which volume. So you can do you can really be in sync with your music. And once you've done that, well done. <laughs> but you haven't even started to compress it. So the normal way to compress is to just go ahead with a JavaScript packer. And the way they work is to look at your code as a string, look at the repeated patterns, and just replace them by a single character. So if we have many function declarations, they will most likely just be reduced to just one character. This is very nice. You get uh, about 25% compression ratio on minified code or on the code that I tend to write. And you need about 70 bytes to decompress that. So that's pretty powerful. But web browsers are actually very nice. They, they can handle compression, as we saw in the previous talk. They support Zlib. And they support Zlib in the form of PNG images. And we can bootstrap PNG images. Um, the idea of PNG bootstrapping is relatively new. But it's basically, you load your code, your JavaScript code, in an image editor as like a raw grayscale image. You save that as PNG. You rename this PNG HTML. And when you load that in the browser, the browser will, will say, hey, that's full HTML. I will load that as HTML. So at the end of the uh, PNG image data, you add an HTML and JavaScript bootstrap that will, uh, that looks a bit like this. Um, so what it does is basically, it puts an image that loads hash, so the page, which is the image, and load, load it, draw the pixels onto a canvas, read the value of a pixel, and rebuild the code and run it. And with that, you get about 40% compression ratio. The unpacker is about 160, 170 bytes, but it compresses at 40%. So at 1K, you, between the two techniques, at one kilobyte, you gain easily 200 bytes with this technique. 
and the higher you go, the more you gain. Uh, I've seen, yeah, I've seen four kilobyte intros compressed that were actually 20 kilobytes uncompressed with this technique. And yeah, once you have compressed your demo, it's time to bring it to 11. So if you are above your target size, it's time to really get dirty and to, to arrange the code and tweak it. You, you need to move the code around and to try to increase the number of patterns so that the code compresses better. Sometimes just moving things around, how you set some CSS properties or, or default values, just, just moving them around makes a difference of 5 to 10 bytes in the compressed uh, ratio. So it's, yeah, if you're above your target, you need to, to really shuffle the things around and see how it goes. But if you're below your target size, then it's awesome because you have enough bytes to actually work on the show. So it's nice to, to try to not give everything away in the first 10 seconds. Um, so try to work on the timeline, on the camera. So it's really boring to see like 3D objects just centered, square and center through for two minutes. It's nice to just move the camera a little bit around. That makes it a bit more interesting. Try to change the colors also over time and space to, again, make things a bit more alive and yeah, just not give everything away too quickly. Yep. So now I think it's about demo time. So here's a project I did a few months back. And uh, yeah, here it goes. This is Matraka, this is one kilobyte. Just pure JavaScript. now, this is your turn. Um, I mentioned many things, but it's actually lots of small things. Uh, it's not black magic. You, you, can, you can build these things on top of many, many small things and just playing around with things. So don't be afraid. This is, not, this is really not black magic. You can do it. And it's super rewarding to do these kind of things. And uh, yeah, as I said, there's many demo parties, so demos in events throughout the year. The next ones that I can think of um, are function in Budapest in one month, deadline here in Berlin in one month, and demo.js in Paris in five weeks. All these demo parties accept remote entries, so you have no excuse to not make something and send them a mail. <laughs> and some of these demo parties have a live stream where you can watch the demo compose live, and it's awesome. <laughs> Just seeing your demos on the big screen and hearing the audience applaud and scream, it's like blowing your mind. So do it, it's so cool. Here's a, a couple of websites um, to get to know a bit more about the demo scene. Uh, yeah, just visit them. Uh, you will. The last one, um, it can take a fixed skin to take some of the jokes there, but uh, Poet.net is really the, the reference if you want to get the latest demos. So, again, thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure. <laughs>